just real quick, I'll, a little introduction, and then I'll um, bring up our panel of experts. Like I've always said, you know, um, I like to surround myself with smart people. It makes me look smart by comparison also. Well, as long as you don't compare, then it's really bad. But it's like guilt by association. Right? If I know smart people, maybe I'm smart too. Um, so for those, I, I think everyone has been through it, except for our crouch back there. Um, the way this goes, just by way of reminder, um, you raise a hand. And you'll get called on, you ask your question, and then we will um, either give you the right answer or make something up that sounds really good. <laughs> One of the two. No, um, no. We'll, we'll, we'll give you an answer, hopefully from the variety of our collective education and background. Um, one of us will have some insight and some knowledge on that. Uh, if not multiple. That's the one thing I love uh, whenever you have multiple people answering the questions. You know, there have been the times I've done this myself, and I, and I enjoy that, and I know y'all have too. But sometimes, not, not that there's different answers, but the different perspectives see things and approach it from a different way. Um, and so my answer may not actually relate to you. It's not wrong, it just may not relate to you. But then someone else can say, well, that's true, but also, and they add to it. And so hopefully that's going to add in um, to the benefit of that. If you guys want to go ahead and come on up, Dave will be joining us here in a minute. He's I uh, just walked in the door and he's getting a little freshened up. We can introduce ourselves. Um, of course, y'all know me. I'm the pastor. Still. Thank you, Lord. Um, and so there's that. Um, I'll let these guys pick their seats and maybe say a word about themselves just real quick. You know, you'll just spend a, maybe just a couple minutes of who you are and why these people should care what you have to say. Um, and then we'll get rolling on the questions. I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Kenneth Vaughn. I recognize uh, most of y'all. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know or don't remember me, I am a uh, PhD candidate at Baylor University uh, working on my doctorate in sociology. I believe this is my third time uh, meeting with y'all and uh, y'all should care what I have to say because your pastor told you to. <laughs> Uh, Patrick Cheney, I have a Master's of Systematic Theology from SMU in Dallas, and uh, I work in Georgetown, though, at my brother's construction company. So as far as anything ministerial, you probably don't want to take my opinion, but if it's early church or the Trinity, which was my focus, I can lead you in the right direction. Hi. Take a moment, Dave. It's okay. I am. Those electrolytes. <laughs> Lots of them. Uh, I've been up since 3.30. Uh, helping with the Miracle Match Marathon downtown Waco oh, and just busting my butt till literally 35 minutes ago. Um, so I'm a little wired. Uh, I'm Dave Dover, husband of three daughters, uh, married to one woman, Teresa, and uh, Masters of Divinity from uh, Southwestern, um, undergrad, North Texas, um, two pastorates, 20 years college ministry experience. Four years um, hospital chaplain and this very thing that we're doing here um, I did it for fun in college we would order pizza and we would argue <laughs> and and I'm not I kid you not we have so many memories of this we would flip a coin Mark would call it he say heads okay you have pro I have I have con and we would pick a topic out of the Bible, and you would have to prove everything biblically. And so everything I have done like that, we've carried it since college. I can't tell you how many roommates love me and hate me um, because we played this game over and over again. And people would come to our apartment just to watch. And, and then it, so it's evolved to this. And, you know, Mark, when he was in the student ministry, we did it for fun. And then we all came with an idea, why don't we do this for church? This is absolutely a riot because you learn so much uh, in a short amount of time and we discovered so many people honestly we're afraid to ask questions uh, because they think um, the pastorate or the minister is a know-it-all we're not <laughs> I'm married and most of you men that know you're married we're stupid because <laughs> that wedding ring holds another ring and she communicates clearly our position in society. <laughs> so that's where we are. And um, but you, you know, I, I cannot say strong enough that this is fun, 
and our history, our lives are at your disposal. So feel free to gut us. All right. Um, what we'll do, if you have a question, um, I'll, I'll try to repeat it back to you, make sure it's clear that we understand what we're trying to answer. It's nothing worse than you asking us a question and us hearing something we're completely wrong and answering something you weren't asking. Um, and so we'll try not to do that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, normally, we've done this, uh, it's been an hour. Tonight, we're actually going to go an hour and a half. And so we, we might take a break at one point. Um, so we'll just see how things are going. So um, does anyone want to get the ball rolling? And I got a first question. Since the first question is awkward. Oh, wait, we do have a first question. Okay. No. Did the angels exist prior to the creation or were they part of the creation? So were they, were they made during those six days lined out in Genesis 1 or were they already there? Obviously they were here pretty soon. Satan was yeah. in the Garden of Eden. But were they here prior to that? Okay. Anyone <laughs> have thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll go. I, uh, I mean, I'll hog the mic if you let me. But so, <laughs> so you're just at... You, I want to make sure I'm clear. You're asking if angels are a part of creation? Part of the creation of the earth and mankind, or were they here prior to the creation of the earth and mankind? Well, biblically, I don't think there's any real, I don't think it's really clear. I do, however, think that throughout church history, it is thought that angels were around in heaven before the first humans, Adam and Eve, were created. I think that's fair to say. But it's also fair to say that they are a creation. That they are not um, higher or lower. I mean, uh, Paul says that we'll judge the angels, right? Mm -hmm. And so, right. Oh well, I can't. I mean, I, I would argue that they were here before hum humanity. I would argue that they were probably in the heavenlies before humanity because of the way uh, Genesis speaks. Um, Genesis one one, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, the heavens being plural, it could be a location thing, but I think that it would probably also refer to the things in heavens, in the heavens. Um, and so I would, I would argue that the angels were probably created before Adam and Eve were created based on Genesis 1-1. Now, that's my reading into it, um, but, I mean, these guys might disagree, and that's fine too. No, I'll add to that if you take the conversation that he had with um, Lucifer the snake at the, at the Garden of Eden. He said, I knew you. I've already known you. So he's already had a relationship with that entity or being or deity. No, deity is the wrong word, excuse me. He already has a relationship there. And we know that he's not the only one. So they would be before mankind. Yeah. Um, now, I, I have always understood it um, in that the, the angels, that we're not told, right? The, the, the creation wasn't about them, it was about or earth and about us, but that it, they would have been created at some time during that, between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 2, 4, that that's when, you know, they were made prior to the time that they had the conversation with Adam and Eve. Uh, we're just not told. Um, like they said, church tradition has kind of held that they've been there prior. Um, when was that prior? We're, we're really just not told. The Bible doesn't say <laughs> there you go. <coughs> Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> that's, right. that's the most theological answer you get. So, are there levels of heavens? Um, yes, there appears to be. I mean, Paul makes reference to being, you know, they have the third heaven. I mean, so there's apparently some kind of layer of different heavens, if layer is the way you want to refer to that. Um, 
Or, as I've understood, just the heavens and the earth. You have the earth and you have everything else. Um, and whatever that else is made up of is the heavens. Um, that, that phrase, heavens and the earth, really just refers to everything that is. I mean, it would just be, you know, everything that exists. It, it would be almost like a, I don't know, a, 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 a term of speech for the Hebrews that says everything that exists. It just encompasses everything. Um, so that's how. Some people refer to heavens on the first level where the birds fly, and the second level where the universe is, and the third would be actually where God resides. You know, technically. I've heard that explanation as well. So I've got any. I've never been to heaven, so I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think I think either way, you the way you say you've heard some people say the sky, the space, and then actual heaven. That, that's a fair reading, and I think to think that there could possibly be different levels in heaven. I mean, I've never been, so why not? I mean, God's a creator, <clears throat> and it and it's tough to take anything out of Genesis and read it. I mean, we're all affected by culture. We can't get a we can't get away from that, and so Genesis was written in a culture. Not that it was any less inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that at all. But it was written by someone in a culture that God was trying to translate to in, their, in the way they understood the way he was talking, the way the Hebrew people would understand, the way, you know, to just say Moses wrote Genesis, right? So the way Moses would have understood it and been able to translate it, um, it's, it's difficult. So you're talking about prehistory. You're talking about something that happened before anyone walked to the face of the earth and, and, and you know, creation. Yes, Paul says he went to the third heavens, but he doesn't expound on that. And so we can just take him at his word that um, he went to the third heaven. And, and what does that mean? I don't know, but it must have been glorious. Yeah. Uh, whatever, whatever it is, it's glorious, and I can't wait to see it. I, I hope to see it. <laughs> okay. Oh, from the back. Um, how old do you think the earth is? Um, I know for a fact it's at least 39 years old. Um, somewhere between 6,000 and 15 billion. Um, I am, um, and I don't know where these guys will land, I, I am what would be called a young earth creationist. Uh, from, from my point of view, I read Genesis and I say, well, all right, you do the math. Um, you got Adam and Eve no more than seven, eight, you know, thousand years ago kind of deal. You're looking in the single digits of the millennia there. Um, I'm not really seeing much other room for anything else to happen. Um, and so that's where I land just because as I read the Bible, you, you date it, you, you start from Jesus. We know Jesus was there and you work your way backwards and you get to Adam and Eve. And, and I believe the case can be made that Adam and Eve are actual, literal, one man, one woman, first created couple. And that's about 6,000 years or so. Okay. Um, where where's all the other time come from? And so I know other people might have different ideas, but that's where I land on that. And I, I've probably held every position there is at one point. And um, so I, for a while I was a theistic evolutionist, which would believe and pretty much the uh, conventional uh, story of the secular sciences, but that somewhere God moved. I, I don't hold to that anymore, and I've been a, an old earth creationist. I've been a young earth creationist. Uh, right now, it, it, it's a matter of inquiry for me, so I, I don't have a succinct position. I would agree with wh what a lot of it has been said already. I think that Genesis uh, reads pretty much like history. Um, I know there are a lot of Hebrew scholars who believe that as well. Uh, I believe that Adam and Eve need to be, uh, that they read like literal people, that they need to be literal people for uh, parts of the gospel narrative to be true. Uh, so I, I believe that. Now, it's only a matter of the years that I've heard people who are smarter than me say, no, this can only add up to six to 10,000 years old. And I've heard people who are smarter than me say, I, I, see, I see a gap here where you can put anywhere from 10,000 to a few million years old and a year's in that gap. And, uh, they're both smarter than me, and they argue with each other, and it's like the Proverbs say. One person's case seems great until, I'm obviously paraphrasing here, until someone else makes their case known. And that's where I'm stuck at. I, I agree with everything that, that he said. Um, I'm trying to figure out the years, and I hope, hope to have a great answer next time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I, I'm probably a little further down the spectrum. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily hold that it's just 6,000 years. I think the Earth's a lot older than that. I think the universe is a lot older than that just because I think that there's enough evidence out there in, in the science world that, it, that the universe is constantly expanding. And, um, you know, I don't know what to do with the days because the way we read days is not the way that the Hebrew people understood numbers, the way we read numbers. that they Their calendar was different than ours. The hours of their days were different than ours. The re, like, have you ever thought the reason that Good Friday's on Friday and then we, we say Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday and we say, oh, it was three days? Well, no, in our language, that's only two days. Saturday and Sunday, that's only two days later. But the way they understood days was sun up to sundown, not during the daytime. So in the evening... When he died, that would have been three. Friday evening would have been one day. Saturday evening, so Sunday would have become the third day when the sun came up. The way it's funky, right? It's just funky. It's, it's hard for me to understand too. So I don't know. Um, that's the best answer I can give. And when when I get asked that, I usually I usually ask back like, why are you asking? Just inquiry? Is it just uh, general? Just curious? That's wonderful. Be curious. Di dive in. You know, the, the Bible says a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Well, if God lives outside of time, then a day could be a million years. A day could be one million years. A day could be a billion years because we, we, we trust that God sees the beginning from the end. So he, the, the, the thing about Jesus that's so uh, miraculous is that he chose to enter into time with us in humanity. Before that, God is outside of time. He sees it all. He's, he lives in what we call the eternal present not the eternal future or the past. He lives in the eternal present, meaning it's all happening now for him. And so I, so when it comes to creation, it's like, man, <laughs> that's above my pay grade. I can't say how old the earth, the earth is. I tend to think it's older than six or seven million uh, thousand years just because I like to think that creation is, uh, to me, it just seems more glorious to be older that way. That's just a personal opinion, though. I can't. I'm not going to argue either way, and I'm not going to die on that hill if, if someone uh, came at my faith that way. Because the point of Genesis is not how God created the earth. It's that he created it. Amen. Correct. You know? And so I think it's fun to dive into, and I love science, and I think that's wonderful. I'm a, I'm a science junkie, and I should have been an archaeologist. <laughs> I'm so mad that I was talked out of it. But anyways, that's my opinion. I think it's older than six or 7,000 years old, but I don't know. I mean, I have to play dumb. <laughs> Um, oh, you want mine? Sure. I, I, I lean more where Mark is. Um, I've always enjoyed a, a literal interpretation or a figurative of the story, uh, one man, one woman. But uh, one of my professors used to argue that um, the word Adam in the original text meant Adam, as in a tribe, and Eve, a tribe. And he would describe that the creation account, there was a group of men and a group of women. And it was real hard to digest that because I grew up believing one man, one woman. Um, but I saw his point, and then that made me ask questions of the nature that you have, how old and what's going on here. And I took geology um, twice. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really astounding how you try to figure out uh, rock sedimentation yeah. and, and then try to put in the math for work. Because if things just roll out at a certain yeah. speed and make layers, then your math gets real confusing. But then if you think of giant floods and stuff and, and boulders moving were places that they never thought were floods, and then that explains it, that they just now rediscovered. Because science is being rewritten all, all the time. Because scientists are human, and we have discovered that some of our scientists have lied to us. <laughs> and so the history accounts of certain things goes to the person who's writing history and to the person who's in charge of the printing press at that time. And so I struggle with what people say, this is science, this is real, this is truth. And I'm like, really? Did you realize that over here that was disproved? And they won't listen to this, but it was disproved. And so I struggle with what they say is science. And when they say that the earth is millions of years old, boy, I, I don't know. But I also struggle with 6,000. Because when you study sedimentation, you're like, wow, that's, that's just, you know, that's just sand rolling and creating all those layers. And, and you're like, oh, man. 
And I, I don't know. So I, I, the thing that I, I hold on to is the phrase that he just said. That is, the account of the scripture is not about the time span usually. It's about God. It's a story of how God loved us and how he embraced us. And he's, that's what's trying to be communicated. And so I just, I sort of let that go. And then, of course, my standard answer is, I wasn't there. Right. <laughs> I don't know what to do. It's not going to change my faith. We'll Literally, try. it will not change my faith if I go this yeah. way or I go this way. I still come back to Jesus on the cross. Right. Like he said, he's been a terrible. I think there's been times when I've leaned over here and I'm like, this is it. And I don't think I was right. And I, I think I've learned I need to relax a little more on that and just let it go. I wasn't there. Because it's not going to change my faith if it's one man or one woman or if it's a tribe. Either answer absolutely still comes all the way back to Jesus. Um, so I, I struggle on that one. So I go to the scripture and I go, it's still about God embracing us and him trying to convey that to us and me understanding that. And so that's that's where I fall. I hope that helps. I'm not sure if it did. And, and I'd like to convey for me that God created humans or, or even Adam and Eve, because I hold to that, is not the same question of how old is the earth. Right. Like the earth can be a billion or it can be 10,000. I still think God created humans in his image yeah. and likeness because that's a very deep theological issue mm -hmm. that we have to hold to. Mm -hmm. Because if we just came from apes, monkeys, evolution or whatever, then you have to ask, well, where does our identity and the likeness of God come from? which leads to all kinds of other issues, life issues, Jesus taking on human flesh, this, you know, where do we fit in the order of creation? But uh, just to reiterate, and then we can move on, is that just, just if I think that it, just my belief that the earth's older than 10,000 years old has nothing to do with my belief that God did create humans right. in right. his image. Right. Yeah, there, there is, um, oh, there's, like, there's like a strain among uh, those who are more in the young camp who thinks that, Anyone who would say old, well, they're automatically uh, God-rejecting, Darwinist, evolutionists. And no, there's a lot of people who believe in an old earth and reject evolution. Yep. So, I mean, there, there, there's, there's a spectrum of beliefs in there. And the, the great thing is we can have a multiple beliefs on that issue. And we all turn and look at the cross and say, yeah, but that's where my foundation oh, is. Amen. Regardless yeah. of how the Genesis question is answered. Amen. He could have taken anything. And I, I remember at one point, um, I mean, there's been church leaders who have argued, why did God take six days? Why six days? Yeah. I mean, he's God. He could just, it's done. Why, you know, surely it must be, uh, there are some, uh, none of the names are coming to mind right now. I know some of the church fathers, some of the reformers who have argued um, that Genesis 1 is not literal because God didn't need six days to create. You know, whereas nowadays people say it's not literal because it took billions of years. Well, once upon a time, folks would argue that it was not literal because he really did it instantly. Right? And so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's important, too, is that people, some people would try to argue and say, see, look, we're, we're coming up with all these new ideas because science is for, forcing us to accommodate, that science is making what we once believed untenable. And that's not true. We've been having this conversation almost exactly as we've been having it with a few minor details changed since there has been a church uh, way before that. So that's really important, too, that we can have this discussion purely with the Bible as our anchor, uh, with a high view of Scripture and you know not being forced to con conform to the way ways of the world. So like he said, there are some people in the Young Earth camp who might say, well, if you're not towing the party line here, you're, you're compromised. And... Yeah. At best. Uh, and, and that's not what we're saying here. The key word was party line on that one. Yep. That there are, there are camps. Yep. Yep. It's also funny that uh, it's also a funny line you, you start wiggling on with science and theology. It just is. Because science is, science is the only of the sciences, I guess, because philosophy is a science. That it's the only science, though, that claims this is true as far as we know. It's only, it's only true as far as we know, right? I mean, uh, Albert Einstein's theory of, of, of relativity, 
disproved hundreds of scientific laws that were thought to be big T truths up until this point. Whereas in theology and philosophy, we have to, we, we have to sort of have a different standard. We can't say, well, this is true as far as we know. Mm-hmm. And then uh, without totally rejecting something later, like, like is God Trinitarian? It, 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 he either is or he isn't. It's not as far as we know. Anyone else that comes out with a different revelation that says, no, it's not. Well, the church has always said, well, then that's heretical. It's not, it's not, oh, okay, yeah, this and that, you know, so it's a, it's a funny line because you're dealing with two different thoughts of thinking. Science has the ability to say, well, this is true as far as we know. It's a billion years as far as the sedimentation and the math. Some other, someone else comes along and does different math on Lake Michigan. Oh, well, now this is true. And it's just as scientific. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas theology is a different, it's a different river. So it's always funny to, uh, yeah. to toe that line and have those discussions. <laughs> Um, if, if I'm correct, and I'm, I'm weak on this, but I, I, I think I know what you're referring to. Um, he wasn't here when I told you I'll silence your phones. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, when, when NASA was trying to put the space program together, there was an article written about it that kept failing over and over again. And eventually one of the scientists said, uh, hey, if you plug in time according to scriptures, and that would be the gaps where I believe Moses held his hands up and time stood still. And I don't remember the formula. I just know a generalization of the story. When they plug that in, then what they were trying to do worked. They had to use the Bible and they had to use their math of those absent hours and days, and then it worked. And I wish I knew the article and I could refer to it better, but I read that story 20 years ago. Okay. And is that the, is that the one you're talking about? Okay. And so they, like they I said. the Hubble telescope, right? I, that was before Hubble. Just, oh, okay. It was before Hubble. Well, then that's a different they were story. just trying to get to space. Okay. okay. And, um, but that's before how they. Your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that. I'm not. Uh, maybe I am. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, I didn't so, say it. <laughs> but anyway, but they, they yeah. use scripture to prove science, which is what, and, and that's our worldview anyway. I look through the world through not rose colored glasses. I look through the world through scripture or through the cross or through the blood of Jesus. So I take that worldview with me and then I try to figure out what's going on. And when scientists come along and try to undercut. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I mean, they used a lot of different things right. to indicate the time difference. Now, I, I, I will say, because I, I've seen examples where people have said, um, oh, look, the Bible says this, and then we figured this out, and, 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 and really they didn't. I, I'm trying to think of some examples where it's uh, like someone makes up a fanciful story, and it's like, well, that would be neat, but that really didn't happen. The, the big one is the, the missing day. That was always a rumor that they found uh, – was it Joshua's missing day? Yeah. Or, that was one of the more popular uh, uh, ones that ended up being a hoax. I, I haven't heard of any of the other claims that are brought up, so I can't speak to them. But that was one. That, that there was an internet rumor years ago that NASA had found that when, when the sun stood still or something like that, that somehow they had retrospectively <laughs> proven that. I know that one ended up not being the case. That one was disproved? The, yeah. the Joshua one, I believe, yes. Okay. And, and, and I've heard where they've said, oh, well, this happened in the Bible, and if you follow the charts back, whatever, there was an eclipse that day. Well, no, there wasn't. Or maybe there was, but it wasn't in that area. And, and so people will take, they'll, they'll grab at some little, any little thing to try to show that the Bible's true um, when they're kind of working too hard to prove things that when there's all, other already really good yeah. information. We don't have to struggle quite That's that what hard. I was going to add. All, even, even if none of it's true, we don't need it. Yeah, I mean, there's already an abundance. So, so.
Okay. I'm going to try to refine that and reread it. Um, that will help me. Do we have anything from this section? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're good in their faith. <laughs> They're going to be future apostles and disciples and just future trailblazers. Future. Yes, ma'am. I know it. It's, I know it's it one that I don't like either. It confuses me very Is much. Is that the one you have me look up? <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, I had fun with that one. Yeah. yeah. Do what? It is. Um, <clears throat> since you have that nice big Bible right there. Can oh, yeah. You, just go ahead and read. Where's Those Exodus? New Exodus, Testament? Exodus. Oh. <laughs> oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Exodus. Don't even. Right, that's, uh, <clears throat> so we all looked it up. <laughs> Exodus yeah. 4. Oh, so we have four uh, interpretations then. Yeah, there you go. 424, like right? Never commented I, on my, I have to do you just want the verse, or do well, you want well, the story I, well, around it? Or? Just so they know what Maybe we're like talking about. Maybe like 23 to 26 probably makes it work. <clears throat> yeah. well, I'll start at 21. Is that fair? Sure. Now, I'm reading out of the uh, NRSV. I don't know. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And it said, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I said to you, Let my son go, that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. Now I will kill your firstborn son. On the way, at a place where they spent the night, the Lord met him and tried to kill him. Uh, some, some say on the way to the, the, the place they met, the Lord met Moses and tried to kill him. And then it says, But Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it, and said, truly you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then she said, a bridegroom of blood by circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. There you go. Let's go back to Genesis. That's what's <laughs> confusing. Let's talk about oh, I had, I had fun with this. Don't yeah. Day. Oh, I love don't, don't me? No. Do you want to go? Do you want me to go? Do you like mine? No, go for it. Do you like mine? Okay. Um, I don't know what they did, but when Mark gave me a little heads up on this one, yeah. I got I got to find... I have to find Mark first. Hang on. Uh, I'm, right, I'm right here. <laughs> no, I, I really, I would rather read what I wrote him. Okay? And you got to remember, I'm older, I'm senile, and I'm married. <laughs> A passage obvious of obedience mixed with an attitude of fine. Now, if you're married and your wife has said fine to you, you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, this is an attitude of the woman, Zephora. She's saying fine. If you read the Bible and you put that in there, you get a true understanding of what's going on. Mixed with, I will fix it so Moses can be a leader servant since now his house is in order. When I read the scripture, I remembered the story and I understood Moses' house was not in order. He had not obeyed God. His son had not been circumcised. We take that and we actually blow it off in America. We don't take that serious. Well, they take that stuff serious. And God takes that serious. And if you look at scripture, it has been taken serious several times. Well, this was a serious moment. And she said, fine, I'll fix it. She took a flint and she went and performed the operation. And then she got a little snotty with it, and she went to Moses and touched his feet and put it there and said, See, it's done. It's resolved. Now you can be who you need to be in the kingdom of God. And that's how I interpret it. And the only reason I believe I can interpret that way is because I'm married. <laughs> because there's times in your life when you're not right with God and your spouse says, Straighten up now. And I think she said, Straighten up. And she fixed the situation as Obviously, as an individual could, because he hadn't obeyed God. And if you read certain scriptures, there's, I, I, I think I even preached it here. Um, when they moved the ark, he died. The reason why? They didn't obey the scripture. What was the issue? They didn't carry with wooden poles. And it was a real obvious statement. The only way to carry the ark is with wooden poles. And when they put the wooden poles in there, nobody died. There's some things in scripture where absolute obedience takes place. 
And when that, when that is done, then we're okay. And when it's not done, we're not okay. And um, so, ma'am, that's how, when I read the story, in my history, and my culture, I interpreted that. I think that's a fair statement. It may not be accurate, but I do believe that the Lord said, please straighten up. And she took scripture serious, and she took her relationship with her husband and said, serious, and we're going to fix this. And just to throw in, um, because you did give me the heads up on that one, I, several commentaries that I consulted um, said somewhere around that same thing. That, that the point was that Moses had not Time obeyed God. He now, hadn't man. been, you know, certain size of son. And, so that, commentaries. Oh, no, in order to get right. This is your book, my book. Yeah. I don't think that. Yeah. Right. Why couldn't well, you have told him at the bush, hey, get your house in order? And, and, and here's here's the deal, right? If Moses is Moses is who, who we say wrote the first five books, so he's writing this about himself. We we don't know every day. Maybe God did say at the burning bush. I mean, we have to take that into account. I, I said this before to another group. I, I was like, you know the problem with reading the Bible? It's the great thing about our faith, too, is we don't edit. Yep. We say, here it is. You get to wrestle with Exodus 4.24, just like <laughs> everybody else is wrestling with Exodus 4. The other great thing about the Bible, though, is that we're honest with ourselves. And, and, and But you only get the highlights, right? Like, even with Jesus and the disciples, you don't get every day that they just sat around. No, you get the highlights of a someone being healed. Oh, a blind person. This, you, and so it's like there's there's time and there's obviously time in there between God calling Moses and him going because he's not 80 until he actually goes to Egypt. And we just don't know. It, it's not in there if God did say, hey, you need to do this. Clearly, it was said at some point because his wife knew who wasn't even an, an Israelite. She that's, wasn't even Hebrew. That's <laughs> oh, oh, there's, oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so she, yeah. she knew. But the, but theologically, I think it's a beautiful story mm -hmm. that shows how serious God takes covenant. Yes. And it, and it wasn't, the point wasn't that, that God, I don't think God wanted to kill Moses or he would have. He, he would have been have, dead. He would have been dead. I think God wanted, right, I think God wanted him to, one, recognize his identity in him as a son of God, an Israelite recognize what God's called him to do and recognize the covenant. And I think her putting that skin on his feet, it's a covenantal act. That's what you did. You walked in blood with your feet. That's how Abraham and Jesus, the burning pots of went through the, went through the blood. That's how you made a covenant. And she put the blood on Moses's feet and said, now you are a, 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 a groom of blood or, or however it's forced. And, and, that, and sometimes that's read negatively, right? But it could have been positive, right? Like now, now we're blood brothers. Now you're in the blood. Now you're a groom of blood to me. Now you are good. Now we can go. And and then it goes right on to when Jesus went in, or Jesus, <laughs> when Moses went into uh, Egypt. Woo, man, I need to quit talking. Yes, God, I mean, that, that, that was one of the parts that stuck out the most to me is that God met him there to kill him. But somehow temporally, we kind of got there just in time with the, with the foreskin as if it was really by the efforts of, uh, of men and women. Well, you know, God doesn't try, God does. Uh, God doesn't, it goes back to that question, there must have been a reason for six days because God could have done it instantaneously. So it's, I think God is giving him an opportunity to get his house in perfect order before the rest of the Exodus story and what comes after that unfolds. That clear, clearly God, the fact that they had time to get this done, that was an allowance. If God wanted him, wanted him dead, he'd be dead. If God tried to kill him, he'd be dead. Uh, we, we've seen this happen later on with Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira. Right. I mean, that's what that looks like. Yeah. If God wants you dead, you just. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you have something about this? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we often lose sight of because we think of sin as, oops, I made a mistake. Um, 
No, from God's eyes, sin is um, us deserving exactly what he was being threatened to Moses there. Um, and so, yeah, that's something to... And it's a great reminder that God's grace has always been there. I remember one of the first ones we did, a question came up that kind of presupposed a juxtaposition of an angry God of the Old Testament versus a graceful God of the New Testament. But uh, one, you can see signs of God's wrath in the New Testament, but there is also an abundance of signs of God's grace in the Old Testament as well. Uh, we let, sometimes we let certain debates and cultural ideas define the parameters for us when we ought not do that. But this is a great reminder, I think, that that yeah, we, was a moment of grace. He got grace. I mean, that's just um, awesome. And, and one final thought on this, and then we'll catch another question. I think I saw him. Um, as we read the Bible, sometimes we come across things and we just go, what? <laughs> what is going on there? I mean, there, there's things like um, whenever uh, Abraham, I think, makes a pledge to somebody or someone makes a pledge to Abraham, they stick their hand under his thigh. Mm -hmm. What? That doesn't make any sense. And one thing that I think we need to remember as we're reading through the scripture is that even though it's written for us, it wasn't written to us. And so there's things that, you know, when Moses was writing, he wasn't writing to 21st century Americans. He mm -hmm. was writing to... Or Christians. Or, or Christians. Yeah. He was writing to... Israelites, you know, 3,000 or so years ago. Um, and so there's going to be cultural things that he was writing to them that the, the principle still gets conveyed, but we scratch our head and go, what? They, they did some weird things back then. Yep. It didn't make any sense to us um, because it wasn't written to us, but it was <coughs> written for us in order for us to understand God and who he is and his uh, principles of life and things of like that. So, um, all right. We had a. Did you have your hand up? No. Oh, you she did. did. Come I on. saw oh, we it. Did. I did. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Do this, everyone. You don't have a minute. Come on. <laughs> um, there wasn't paper back then, right? So. <laughs> Not the way we have paper, but there no, was. Like, Um, one, they did, I don't know, we'd call it paper. Um, it was a different kind of type substance. Um, but, I mean, they, they had means of writing and recording things. It wasn't just all chiseled stone, though some of it's that. I mean, some of that's what we have. But as far as the, the Bible, they would have scrolls of this parchment type material. Um, they just these big, long, it was like, I mean, it was like paper, but it wasn't paper like we have it. But, um, Right, they spoke a different language also. Who translated it? Um, people who know both languages. I mean, there's, I mean, the same way if, if, if somebody wrote something in Spanish and you wanted to be able to read it in English, you'd have to get someone who speaks them both to do the translating. Um, and so, that, that, that looks like you're unsatisfied with that answer. No, I'm satisfied with it. Okay. That's a very good it's question. A, it's yeah. a very so fair so question, so and it's an actual fun study one day, to, and you could probably Google it now. We lived before Google, <laughs> okay? We had to read the books, okay? Even and, I lived before Google. Yeah. <laughs> did you? Okay. Yeah. All right. We didn't have computers. It, and that's an actual fun study, and, and when I did that study, here's what I learned. That in, in translating scripture, you had to be extremely precise. So whatever I wrote... And when it was his turn to write, he had to write it exactly. And when it was his turn to write, he had to write it exactly. When it was Mark's turn to write, he had to write. My documents, when they were old, got burned. Then his, when they got old, were burned. Until only Mark's were left. <coughs> then you bring it up all the way up to the last 800 years, give or take. And they start translating it. And people tried to be as precise as possible, okay? And when they went from when they went from Arabic to English, 
That's when you start getting all the Bible translations we have. And you can make a straight line and you can put them there because people would go letter by letter or they would go sentence by sentence. This book, <coughs> NSRV, is sentence structure. Okay? King James tried to do letter by letter. Living <coughs> is paraphrased. Off of, a, off, of a, off of the Septuagint, the Greek and translation off of, the, off of, of the, the original. Yeah. So, And they tried to be precise, but they also brought their culture with it. Yep. And they, there's, there's some differences, and you can see them. If you read the Living Bible, you will notice that the word baptism is thrown away. And his seminary professor asked him, I, I taught you better than that. How can you throw away the word baptize 66 times? How, how do you do that? And he said, well, I'm just trying to tell a general story. He says, yeah, but look what you just removed. Yeah. Right. You just removed everything. But he goes, well, I'm making it more of a newspaper print. Thus, that's how we got the Living Bible. Then, you want to take it further? You got people who, who when you discover Scripture, why we have the Protestant Bible versus the Catholic Bible. They had a big meeting like this, and they argued. And they argued loud, hard, <laughs> and long. Council of Nicaea and... They figured out what scripture was scripture based on who had it, who didn't have it. And then that's when they said, this book of books will be our Bible. And there was a split. People disagreed. And there's another book that's a little thicker, and that's the Catholic Bible. Because people were trying to figure out what's real. And you want to look all that up? It's a lot of fun reading. Because it's, it's, it's a great history read. How in the heck, like, how do we get that? How do you know that I was accurate? Okay, I was accurate. I was the first scribe. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe his hand slipped a little. <coughs> well, the time to get to Mark, you're way out in left field. One thing that I would point out, one of the reasons but I don't we think know. Nobody slipped. I mean, because you asked the question, how, well, then, but how can we know that it's right? Because what happened was it wasn't just a one to one to one yeah. to one chain. It wouldn't be he would copy him. It would be him and 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 him, and him would copy. And then so, you, you know, I mean, you, you'd have, you know, dozens of copies. And then from those, you would have dozens of copies. And then from those, you'd have dozens. So we have thousands of copies of the Bible to where you can actually compare. And if you look and you say, okay, two-thirds of these or three-fourths of these say this and the other fourth say that. Okay, well, you know, the ones that say different, well, we know that's wrong. You know, that one's a mistake because all these others, yes. you know, and so you can actually compare the messages. The, the more copies that got made, you can actually compare. So we can actually identify where the errors are. We, we can look in the Bible. There, there, there's parts of the Bible that they, they look and they say, we think this, this line here was actually added. Because we can compare. We, we can actually know where spelling errors were made, where different names or, or wrong names got used by a scribe because all the other 99% of people who copied it used a different name. And so that's one of the reasons we can know what's true because we have so many copies. We can put them up next to each other and see where, who made a mistake and where did they make it. And for the passing it down, we, we have an unfortunate metaphor, and it's probably one of the worst ways, but also one of the most common ways. We describe how we got our Bible of the game of telephone. Y'all know the game of telephone? Where you whisper something in someone's ear, then they whisper it, and by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's totally different. Nothing, that's probably the worst way you could describe the historical transmission of the Bible. Because in the game of telephone, one, you're intentionally distorting your speech. Two, as this one-to-one -one scenario that you described that we don't, that, like you said, we, that's not actually what you have. There's no checks and balances there. No one is verifying that what you're saying is correct. So you've rigged the game to make sure it's distorted. But that's not what's happening, right? Like he said, you have all of these manuscripts all at once. You have, especially with the New Testament, you have a historical tradition surrounding it. Uh, I, I don't know the Old Testament story as well. I know there's, there, there are commentaries, but you have, you know, the very first generation of Christians who saw all of this unfold commenting on who did they know that knew Jesus, that who also knew Jesus, and what does, what do the manuscripts say? What do the Bibles, what does the Bible say? And they're quoting the Bible. So you have, for example, John, he has students named uh, Polycarp and Ignatius of Antioch and Papias. And then there are people who know, 
those three guys writing about those three guys. And then there are people who knew the people who knew them writing about them. And you can do, you can, I could get a book in the library, a theological book in the library, go to the reference section, go find their oldest citation, go look at their oldest citation, and I could make a paper trail all the way back to John, all the way back to Jesus. All the while, they're talking about the Bible. They're talking about these historical events. And as we said, discussing another question, we put it all out there. We have, we have the information out there so that people, ha people raise these questions. What about, quote, banned books of the Bible? And I said, well, the, yeah, that, that's a really easy thing to address, that we were talking about these things. We weren't burning them. We weren't hiding them, for the most part, uh, from, from society. There, not to, there, wasn't a, there were people out there who wanted to do that, but we, have, we know exactly when in history these books popped up 400 years later in the wrong language uh, with the fraudulent author attributed to them. And, and it was a real easy choice. Uh, so there's actually an abundance of information to kind of check and double check and double check, more so than anything else we have for, uh, you know, for Julius Caesar, for Alexander the Great, for virtually anyone else in history that we don't have doubts about. If you were to take the, your English professor, they, they have a little math formula for who Homer was, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. They call him the blind prophet. And they have like 25 rules to prove that Homer wrote that book. If you apply those same rules to the Bible, the Bible wins every time. Mm -hmm. But they won't do that because they don't want to prove the Bible is, right. is accurate. More manuscripts, closer to the date of the people who live there. I mean, we're talking 30 years versus hundreds of years. Oh, yeah. For anyone else in ancient history. But if you ask your English professor who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, they'll go home with the Bible prophet. You're like, but you can't prove that. Even your 25 rules won't prove it. It's still a guess. Take those rules and apply them to Scripture, and we can prove it every time. It's so much fun. The Dead Sea Scrolls might be the single most important yeah. um, archaeological find to, to prove that. Oh, yeah. You can look up the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a different culture, though, too. you got to understand that it, our faith came through the Jewish culture. Like, if I asked you, can you stand up and recite the whole New Testament by memory? I can't do that. In the Jewish culture, they could recite the whole Old Testament by memory. That was they were fifth very, grade education. Right. <laughs> they were a very oral culture, and we've gotten away from that mm -hmm. in ours, sadly. I mean, even from, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 40, but even from me to just 20-year-olds, there's a big discrepancy. When I grew up, I sat around with nanny and granddad and aunt and uncles, and we sat on the porch in Moody, Texas, and we talked. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you every story from my family because we talked. And that's truth. That's true. I can tell you. I can tell you stories about Moody, Texas that people probably don't even know. And I hadn't lived in Moody in over a decade because I grew up there and listened to the stories about Stampede Valley, about Mother Neff State Park and all that. They grew up in that culture. You know, and, and, and um, the only proof I have of that, that it works, is when I was in seminary and they were talking about this and people were questioning the validity of an oral culture. I was able to sit there and tell stories that my professor had said three years earlier that, that they were like, how do you remember that? And I was like, because I grew up in a culture where you sat around and talked and when your brain's trained to think that way, you could tell me a story and I'll remember it. Amen. You know, that's how they were trained. That's how they were raised. That was their culture. They lived in a theocracy. Yep. And, and so um, it's hard for us to sit in very valid questions. Seek it out. How do you know? How do you know it's true? Man, how do we know that all this is handed down correctly? That's awesome. Ask. God's not afraid of that. The Holy Spirit is not afraid of that. Trust me, we've all been there on that, on that same journey. We've all been yeah. like, this, this could not be real. This is a <laughs> fantasy fairy tale, man. And it's a fun journey. It's a fun it journey. It, it, just, uh, you know, I'll end with this. It's a great question. We've just barely like 30,000 feet bird's eye view scratch the surface. Yep. You could go take multiple classes upon classes upon classes on this. You, you could actually just major in and, you know, go through, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD and do nothing but study this topic and you won't exhaust yourself. Yeah, I know of a guy who's getting his but doctorate don't do it on in student one manuscript, on P45. That's Make it. Sure you get that's his doctorate. <laughs> so, okay. Hey, I said, we'll, I said uh, we'll take a break. If y'all need to stretch some legs, get up, do some jumping jacks, visit uh, <laughs> little boys' room, little girls' room, whatever. And then we'll come back here in about five minutes or so, maybe about five after, and uh, cool. wrap it up for the last bit. <laughs> All right. We live in a, we live in a huge atheistic culture. I wish we would use this culture question.
like had some chit chat back and forth, came up with some new questions. Cyclists I run into don't. I'm talking other stuff. So I have befriended a lot of guys. That's all right. That's all right. And I I talk to them more privately, so you don't see them. All right. So you'll see other comments. What do we have? Welcome back. Really know. I see a few folks had to leave that made me sad, but I understand. Um, all right. Of course we're Rounding the last the turn into the home stretch. What do we have? Now you're out there. I know. <laughs> and and, I and, and just so you know, hold on. Greg, we'll get you in a second. We're, we're going to endeavor to um, shorten, be a little more concise oh, on our response. Oh, okay. Well, fine then. Ignore that. Just just ramble. Yeah. Why do you look at us? All right. I don't know. <laughs> Hey, man, don't ask a systematic theologian a theology <laughs> question and then expect it not to be a systematic That's answer. Right. Don't get that. that makes no sense to why, us. Why invite us if you want us yeah. to be quiet? You just want yes and no answers? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Okay. <laughs> there, let's go home. All right, we're done. Filled in the cross. <laughs> yeah. Greg. Greg. How close are we to a revival? Yes. All right, and what do we need to get going? And what do we need to get going to, for a revival? What is, going to take, is it going to take a worldwide event to, to get people back in church? I anticipate it, and I will come every time with my thoughts on revival. I love this question. I um, so, That's with what's happened in the last year that sure. we've been here with ISIS and Trump and yeah. what else is going around? You know, you're the sociologist. Tell me. Well, well, first and foremost, you know, we a revival is – involves an act of God, that it, it's a blessing on a society. Uh, we don't have a step-by-step -step biblical formula. This is what you can do when you're guaranteed a revival. So it's kind of a sociological natural theology here. What it, We look at the patterns throughout revivals and what can we extrapolate from this and test it according to scripture. Uh, what I see one is Churches that tend to thrive, this has been vetted in the literature, the sociological literature for a long time, I'll try not to use jargon, uh, but um, is that churches that stand out from the world, as we're called to be, to be separate from the world, to be sanctified, to be holy, these are the churches that thrive, and even in a society that's secularizing, where people are abandoning God, it's the churches that have tried to accommodate the world that die the first, uh, that die first, and that die the quickest. So those are your things to avoid. Uh, if you want a revival, those are ways to make sure you don't get a revival bar just a complete act of God is try compromising, try, try to make the world like you. The people intuitively know that there's something broken in the world. They don't want church that looks like the world. I wouldn't wake up at 10, you know, early in the morning on a Sunday. I, I, I get here at 10, sorry. I wouldn't wake up at nine or eight or nine on a Sunday to come sit in a wooden pew when I could be having brunch because church is the same as the world. Brunch is great and pancakes are delicious, right? I go to church because something about this message matters, that it's worth, you know, getting a screaming kid in the car, not having bacon, and, and, that, and that sort of thing. That, and, and we know that this is true. So stand out from the world. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to pray. I mean, you, this, this is an act of God. Now, as for world events, you know, uh, right now, as exciting as things are, I, I take a broad historical perspective. I, I don't see a lot of things that are unprecedented yet. So I... Uh, you know, the Lord could come back at any moment, but I, I don't see uh, I don't see uh, the end days or end time prophecies under every rock or any of that or any of that sort of thing. Uh, ISIS is uh, the Islamic State. It's kind of on the wane right now. Uh, they've lost a lot of members. They've lost a lot of territory. Uh, persecution of the church around the world. It's intense. It's been worse in history, though. Uh, the 20th century, while uh, the Soviet Union was still was still there, that was a lot worse. Things have gotten relatively better in China. They're kind of getting worse, but compared to the 20th century, they've gotten better. Uh, even the days of the early church, uh, during those waves of persecution, there are fewer Christians to persecute, but a higher proportion of Christians were, were, under, the, were under the knife at that point in history. So, um, and the church is growing in those places. And the, yes, absolutely. Um, it's dying here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where it's easy. Where it's easy. Uh -huh. um, it doesn't cost us anything, so what's the point? Um, so how do we get a revival? You, you, you pray, you, you do what the Lord is asking you, you do what you can to go out and create that and turn hearts toward God, but you know, rely on him. That, it's a tremendous moment of grace when that happens. I think in the course of church history, it's relatively rare. Uh, but we, we just got to rely on him. There, there are very few steps that we can take. And, and it's just straight up to stay, to stay faithful and pray. Years ago, those churches were Mm-hmm.
Well, you, if you're thinking about something happening, something in break, and if you watched any of the Facebook stuff and all these little walks and and um, um, protest and and how almost riotous they are and how ugly and how really vocally ugly people are with their language toward each other. When you look at some of the older revivals, one of the things that happens in them, and this is one story that comes, <coughs> is that people returned, I repeat, returned everything that was in their home that was stolen and took it back to the docks where they think it came from. So much so that all the dock workers had stopped. We can't take anymore. People were so convicted that their home had stolen goods, they returned it all. Now, you look at all these Facebook pages where people are doing all these marches and things. Think of them totally repenting with tears and saying, I'm sorry. The only way that's going to happen is through an absolute conviction of God. Now, you're looking at them and they. But now put a mirror in your face. What are you willing to repent of? Because I, I think what these two guys just said a minute ago, absolute guilt here. We have come complacent, disobedient, and we're not truly honoring God. We are... We are it's easy to go to church. It's easy to do this. We're not really having to face what it really means to love God. And I, I'm still discovering that road. What does it mean to love God in this century? I, I mean, I was late to church. Um, I drove fast. <laughs> okay, that's the polite way to say it. But technically, I broke the law. So I should go find a police officer and say, please write me a ticket. That's the reality. What I just said is the absolute truth. I should find a police officer. Please write me a ticket. I broke the law. Am I going to do that? Probably not. That's why you're laughing at because you know I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I but, wouldn't do it. And, and see, that's what we've got to figure <laughs> out. If we were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we would do stuff like that. So I don't know when revival is going to take place. What, one thing that gives me uh -oh. hope. He threw his hand up. I don't care. Yes. I don't know what church I is it. Go to so. it and visit yeah. and see. Uh, statistically, st that could be a density issue, though. Yeah. Is this in Waco or in this area? Well, one of the same room. Okay. St. Louis. I bet it's St. Louis and Waco. I would guess that these are. Uh, so one issue at play could be that just there aren't a lot of Catholic churches in the area. So if you're Catholic, you just got to go to what's there. For example, in San Antonio, like the one Vietnamese church. Every single Vietnamese Christian goes there in the city. But also it could be that these are, I would guess, these are going to be more conservative uh, churches, theologically speaking. These are probably going to be pre-Vatican II in their theology. So they're convicted, at least from a Catholic perspective, that for them they have a worldview of what does it mean to be a Catholic and to not be a part of the world. And that uh, I bet these are going to be services in Latin probably, um, or at least an, a Latin element to it, that uh, – they're going, they're, they're going to know what it means to be Catholic, even if, if it's things I'm not going to endorse as, as a Protestant Christian. Uh, they probably know what it means to be Catholic, and they have a reason for being there instead of staying home and not committing. Uh, one last thing that popped in my head, though, that does give me hope. If you look at a lot of the, uh, the good parts of the evangelical culture today, 
uh, the way we do, you know, the soul, going out and winning souls, that sort of thing. Where did that kind of revival movement come out of? You can trace that back actually to the counterculture and the hippie movement. That once that reached its highest point of depravity, once they were reaping physical benefits of you know, sexual immorality, once the drug use started taking lives, you had the Jesus people come out of that, which was certainly not a perfect movement, but you had a lot of the evangelical leaders we know of today. Uh, William Lane Craig, there's old pictures of him looking awesome in his bell bottoms and long hair in the youth uh, when he was young. You know, th this was a movement that was saying, okay, the darkness of what we were a part of has actually testified to the glorious nature of the gospel, that we've realized the depth of sin and realized our need, our need for a savior. So sometimes, it, you know, the old cliche about it's uh, darkest before the storm or, or whatever it is, uh, that once it hits its worst point, that, that points to God and that that gave us a desire for, you know, serving our communities, but also bringing the gospel in a very literal uh, way. Uh, you know, the best that social gospel could have given us and the best that, you know, if conservative Christianity could give us to share the gospel, that that came out of the darkest part of a dark movement. And so that gives me hope for the future, too, that as I see things dwindling down, a very real prayer I pray often is, well, let people see the depraved nature of this God and that it would turn them to you. Can I answer? Or are we, we have to be more sincere. No, 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 go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I repent. I <laughs> I, I've been to those Catholic churches in, in Waco, and I, I don't I don't think any of them are Latin. They're all okay. they're all post Vatican too. Just just as a side note, but I would argue that part of it is um, immigration mm -hmm. in this area. But I statistics show that the churches that are growing the fastest in America now are the Catholic and the Orthodox because this generation does not like fakeism. The millennials and all these people that our churches tend to really do a good job of talking bad about don't appreciate fakeness. Mm -hmm. That's why they bounce around on Facebook and this and that. And if you're going to be fake, they'll just go be, they can be fake on here. They don't need to come in. And, and, and the thing that those churches offer that, and, and I'm Methodist, I'm not Baptist, so I'm talking about, I'm pointing the finger this way too. But, and, and so I don't want to make a blanket statement out of all of the uh, Protestant churches or whatever, but is that. We have to quit worrying about if we're a Christian nation. Who gives a C-R-A-P? We follow Jesus. We don't follow a party. And we've got to quit trying to worry. Now, this is a 40-year-old, so maybe elders disagree on this and that. And I'm sorry if I'm being offensive. I don't mean to be. But you want revival? Quit making church about who you voted for for president and start making it about Jesus. Because let me tell you something. I can fit Jesus' messages into both liberal and liberal. I mean, dude, the guy spoke at a Samaritan woman at the well and said, hey, you're sleeping around. And she went and saved the whole city because he pointed out her sin. I can't talk to people that way. They'd hate my guts. They're like, oh, you're just judging me and this and that. Yeah. He said, let me tell you, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You don't. You've got five. Because what is love? Love is willing the good of the other, mm -hmm. not telling them what they want to hear that tickles their right. ears. And if there's one thing that Catholic and Orthodox churches do is they don't tickle your ears. They know what they believe. They believe what they believe. They've believed what they've believed for 2,000 years, and they're not going to change. And something about that statistically is drawing millennials and young people because it gives them a foundation to grab. It's not every other week there's a wishy-washy different this and that. And it's not that we don't have those. It's that for some reason that's not conveyed somehow. Mm -mm. And I think if we want revival, we have to be utterly different. We have to be utterly different than the culture. Because, and, and maybe this is the Generation X talking, I don't see a difference in, in the political parties. Republican, Democrat, they're all about their own power to me. They don't do nothing for me. Jesus is who does something for me. And we have the pearl of great price. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like someone who went out to a field and found a great treasure and buried it and then went and told everybody about it. When's the last time you've told anyone about Jesus? I can't tell you the last time I have. I'm just being honest because I'm not here to point the finger. But if Jesus is really our pearl of great price, man... You know, do they see the difference in you? Do young people see the difference in the joy and the hope? I, I mean, whose president's irrelevant? My, my king is Jesus. And I think that's what will bring revival is when the churches find that fire. You know, John Wesley, I have to throw something about John Wesley because I'm Methodist. So John Wesley <laughs> once said, once, and, and, and this, isn't, uh, this, is, this is tradition, right? So I can't point you to a book or whatever. I got a PhD student next to me, so... 
But someone once asked him, what has made Methodism so big? And there's been a lot of sociological studies. Communists modeled how they grew communism after how John Wesley did life groups. This life group movement, that was all John Wesley in the 1700s. He did that. Take 12 people. When you grow to 24, split. When you grow that 24, split. And actually be holy in society. Yeah, holiness is it? Holiness in society. Go visit the poor. Go do this. And someone said, how do you do it? He goes, God set me on fire and people come from miles around to watch me burn. How on fire are you? And I don't mean to preach, but I can't help it. That's who I am. And, and we've got to be on fire for Jesus yeah. as much as we're on fire for being against something. Being against something is not as powerful as being for something. I, I, I know. I can tell you who's against gay marriage. I know who's against uh, illegal immigration. I know who's for illegal immigration. I know who's for women's march. Man, don't just be against something. Let's be for Jesus mm -hmm. and be for loving people. And sometimes that's going to look dirty. I mean, yep. sometimes you're just going to have to get dirty with people. And, and, and people are going to be like, oh, man, really? You're acting that way or this way. I don't know necessarily how to act. But I know in loving them, man, the Holy Spirit will work. The Holy Spirit will work. It's not going to be America that saves people. It's going to be Jesus. And I love America. I'm not, I'm not a basher, man. I have <laughs> veterans in every war. I fought in every war. I have fought in every war back to the civil and American Revolution. But uh, it's not about that. You, you want revival, it's got to be about the kingdom, right? I want revival, it's got to be about the kingdom. It's got to be about Jesus. That's my two cents. I don't know, maybe y'all. That's the second sermon we've heard today. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. See, I wasn't very succinct. Which is butter. Which is butter. <laughs> uh, 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 church, so you the uh, yeah, 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 I can't. I, I'm, but they brought, he brought up, a, there were a couple very side points that went on there. One, each of those places have a history. And, and it's conservative. They're preaching the gospel. And they're giving some people concrete answers. Are we giving concrete answers where we're showing it and we're living it? Okay? If your pastor, Mark, the guy that's behind this pulpit, called people on the carpet for their sin, would you take him to lunch or would you call him by the side? Please don't talk like that. I'm an unemployed pastor. I didn't get lunch. Me too. And I ran into that couple at a gas station. And they said, hey, we got married. But while they were in our church, I said, you need to get married. They were living together. Nobody took me to lunch. <laughs> they took me to the side and said, you need to stop that. Who's supposed to say that stuff? Mm -hmm. If it's not the clergy, who's yeah. supposed to say that? You're supposed to say, this is for God. This is against God. <clears throat> okay and i think when you start saying more things that's for god and living your life passionately to the point where you're burning they're going to come they're going to follow you they're going to they're going to they're going to sit down and say okay i'll share a cook with you and i'll listen to what you have to say because mm -hmm. we're more about jesus than all the politics stuff mm -hmm. those are fun conversations they really are but we need to be more on this yeah. He, he threw out Vatican II. All the girl left. Oh. See, there's books out there. Oh, there she is. Okay. He, he said Vatican II. Okay. And y'all may not have caught that. That's a church word. There's Vatican I. It's a huge book. Vatican II is a second book. It's huger. Huger? Huger. Huger. Sure. huger. huger. Okay. All right. This is Texas. We make it up. <laughs> I read the book for fun. <laughs> You know what's fun about that book? When you get to the plan of salvation about meeting Jesus, the first five articles are straight out of the Baptist faith and message. You can put them right beside each other and go, wow, 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 wow. Until you get to about the fifth one. And then you go, what? What? And then you want to call somebody up. What did they say? And they throw Mother Mary in there. Mm -hmm. And that's what changes. And you're like, wow. And so when you want to discover how people think and believe, you need to read about their beliefs. Yes. And I read that book for fun. I was like, so what do they believe? Yeah. I don't know what they believe. People have been telling me they're right. No, they've been telling me they're wrong. But the word Catholic used to mean committed Christian. Mm -hmm. If you said you were a Catholic, that's like saying I'm saved by grace to the max. Mm -hmm. Until Vatican II was written. And things changed.
and you see slight changes and slight differences. It's not big, but it's enough to go, uh-oh, what's going on? But those revivals that those churches are taking place, they have a book, they have a formula, and they're following it, and people want a concrete answer. They still want to know what one plus one equals, and that's who they're getting behind. And I think some of our churches aren't saying what one plus one equals, and it's not the clergy not saying it. Well, sometimes. <laughs> you know, I'm real fed up, and this is, I'm going to go off here. I'm real fed up with our society blaming teachers. It ain't the teachers anymore. No, I mean, there's some bad teachers out there that are saying one plus one equals four. And they need to be called to account. Now, I, I, I agree, but but there's too many of the guys that are good that are just being slam dunked because they're they're there. I, I think now, some there's of, too many good guys that are getting kicked out of churches and not leading them because we say one plus one equals two, and it's not what they want to hear, right? Because it doesn't tickle the ears. Yes, sir. <laughs> I in that. I'll pull up. Bro, okay. I'll give um, you that offer. I'm sorry. That was not short, Mark. Sorry, we're uh, we're seminarian and over here. Well, she's, she's like waving. <laughs> Doctor, I refer to you on that one. I read I, Vatican II uh, for fun. I would say no, otherwise the, we wouldn't have had a Protestant yeah, Reformation. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Vatican II yeah. wasn't until the 60s. Yeah. And yeah. the Protestant Reformation was in the 1500s. Right. And, and, and uh, what, uh, what the, 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 you have the Council of Trent. Okay, this is about to get real boring for everybody. Oh, yeah. There's the Council of Trent, which was the response to the Protestant Reformation. And there's a lot of stuff in, the, in that that um, it, it's just a lot of politics and stuff. I, I mean, it's a lot of history. It's really interesting. You can read about it. Vatican II, um, actually, from my reading of it, was when the Catholic Church that we know as the Catholic Church actually said, yeah, we're not the only ones going to heaven. That's what came out of Vatican II. And so you have a lot of older Catholics who don't like Vatican II because of that. That, I mean, people, not not as a whole. Not I, yeah. I don't want to make a blanket statement. I think the church as a whole has really come a long way. The church is. The church, the big universal sea church, all of us, all lovers of Jesus. I think the good thing is, is through the 20th century, we've all come a long way through all the wars and everything to say, man, look, we have some deep differences, but we all say Jesus is Lord. And Scripture says you can't say that unless it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Amen. somewhere we're brothers and sisters in yep. Christ. Yes. And Vatican II is a recognition of that towards Protestants. That's my understanding of and reading of it. But it, it was in like the maybe the 50s or the 40s. It was in the 20th century when yeah. uh, when all the wars and everything. And it's like, well, all right, there's got to be an answer for all of this. And we've got to start uh, – we got to quit pointing at each other and start saying, look, at some point we got to put, get back to back and say, Jesus is Lord. Here we go. And yeah. I think that that's my understanding. But, um, I mean, there's a church history you can read all. Because then you have the Orthodox, right, which split in the 1100s, what we know as Roman Catholics, and you have the Orthodox Catholics, or what we would say Russian and Greek, and they split. And they split over something called the Filioque, right, which is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, which is one word, is, right? I'm simplifying it a lot, but I'm not trying to make a lot of it. But the filioque is in, in our in our statement of faith when we say we believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. There was arguments about Father. Does, does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son? Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father through the Son? Or does the Holy Spirit just proceed from the Father the way Jesus Christ is eternally begotten from the Father? Right? Well, there you go. That's what that that's what that split was over. Was that argument? I, I can't <clears throat> recall who who went what way. I want I want to say the Orthodox say that the, that uh, it's the Father. Yeah, right. I don't know. But so you have all kinds of splits and all kinds of churches, and that's uh, that's part of the problem of Christianity. Not a problem. I shouldn't say that. That's a hard thing for non Christians who are looking at all of us to say. Well, golly, y'all can't even get on the same page of what truth is. That's actually Ooh. a common uh, challenge I'll hear from skeptics is, well, right. why, why should I believe you? I mean, there's 30,000 denominations. Y'all right. can't even agree on what your book says. Why should I believe you? And that, that would be a fun 
Right. And being around Waco, then you always get the whole David Koresh thing too, right? So he gets thrown in there, and it's like, oh, great, man. Still, we're still living in 96. Good Lord. But see, Waco's a classic example. There's 135 Baptist churches. There's over another 100 churches there that either Catholic, uh, Lutheran, uh, Episcopalian. There's over 1,000 churches in Waco for 100,000 people. Right. And there's still over 40,000 who do not claim Jesus in any way, (laughs) shape, or fashion. Yeah. <laughs> but see, and, and then you, you the Baptist churches in Waco, that, no, 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 but that's just as fun. That's just as fun. SBC. You can go to Outback and ask for a hamburger, and you can go to McDonald's and get a hamburger, and they're both different. But it's still meat, cheese, and bread. Okay? You can do the same thing in Waco. You can go to a Baptist church, and almost all the buildings look like this. But the clergy behind the pulpit and the people behind it are totally night and day. And, and it, it's a lot of fun. You, you you got preachers that preach in a robe, you and, and you've got some that don't. And you've got the, some that have a straight liturgy, and you would think you're in a Catholic church. And you have some that are so free that their hands are swaying left and right. And you're like, I don't think I'm in a Baptist church, but you are. Mm-hmm. And then you have, but that's the neat, to me, that's the neat thing about Christianity. If you love Jesus... That's what counts. The flavor is optional. And, and so you can love God and embrace him based on part of your culture. Because if, if, I, if, I, if I was uh, in San Antonio and I was Korean, I would sing those songs in Korean. So if I go to a Korean church, why would I get mad at them? For singing a song in Korean and walk out going, well, I didn't feel like the Holy Spirit was there. I don't speak Korean. They're speaking Korean and they're singing Korean. The Holy Spirit's still there. I just and, and America, I, I think we don't understand that. I think we think it has to only be this way. It's Mama's chili, and that's the chili I'm only going to eat. All other chilies aren't good. And my church is good, and another area of the church isn't. And if we can ever break that concept, I think there would be a little more revival and a little more Jesus. Uh, and, and I don't know. I'm about. I'm sorry. Um, we 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 are actually getting just into just a tad bit over time. But we had an online question, and it's from a member who couldn't be here, but they're watching. And so I wanted to make sure we addressed it. I don't think it'll take long, so we can wrap it up. Um, so member gets priority. <laughs> okay, just don't want to. Um, and, and I don't remember word for word, but basically it is about the dietary laws. Why was it wrong to eat certain foods in the Old Testament, but then we're allowed to eat them now? Now, now, now we understand that Jesus, you know, came along and said, you know, about cleanliness, and you know that doesn't make you unclean. Why did that change? Why would it be bad then, and okay now? I, I believe is about the just you, you read it. Is that about the just yes. what the question yes. was? So, foods. They were bad then, right? Uh, bacon. Bacon. You couldn't eat bacon, right? Shrimp. Anyone like them a good shrimp? You know, fried up or however you like it? I mean, so why would that have been wrong then and okay now? trying to think I, I think you answered it in your own question when you said well, jesus i don't know yeah. well, i don't know well, another answer I mean, that. there's the understanding that, that there's the understanding that it, it did change law grace grace you know, but. And my, my only answer is that is in, in acts when the it came down from heaven and the, he revealed it because why would you call what i call clean unclean anymore right and and that there opened the door in grace and the whole culture change and not only just that food i mean even at from that standpoint on how we viewed male and female culture kept it stymied for a while but it wasn't stymied in that moment and that's um and the early church was actually really feministic compared to culture around as far as women i i agree i think i think it's a cultural question that we we don't understand it's not about uh food necessarily being clean or unclean or healthy or unhealthy it's it's a religious thing it's a and i'm not saying religious in a bad sense like a religious spirit it's a it was a religious thing of how to be close to god and there's a way to be close to god and there's a way not to be close to god 
and I think it's I think it just I think that shows the enormity of the work of Jesus Christ is that is that we are free from that because he because he has made not just that clean but he makes us clean so it's not about right Jesus says that it's not about what goes in that makes a person bad it's what comes out to so I think that I just think that it points again to the enormity. And we have to understand that when you read, at least my understanding is when you read from Old Testament, Genesis, all the way to Revelation, that it's a salvation story. And so you see God changing things. That's why you have different covenants. You have the Noahic covenant with the ark. You have the Abraham covenant. You have the Davidic covenant. Then you have the covenant uh, with Jesus. Well, Jesus is a covenant, but that changes everything. But you see the salvation history, and I think the dietary laws are a part of that. It's a part of God's saving action. So it's law versus grace. Right. A lot of time, yeah. Yeah, I, I, grace I, to offer when you law. Yeah, I, I think part of it gets kind of what I mentioned before about, you know, the Bible wasn't written to us. Um, and, and so whenever, there's parts of that, the law under the covenant of Moses that are specific to Israel, to their situation, to their culture, for that time, for that purpose of setting them apart. So it's not that there's something evil about eating pig, right? But at that time, in that place, that was a way that he said, you're special. Yeah. And, and, and to make yourself special, I'm going to set you apart and these things you don't get to do, right? Um, like like, like the, the, the shaving, you know, the way they, had, they couldn't cut their hair or shave their beard or the way they had to do their clothes. What does that have to do with being good or evil or right or wrong it was specifically for you're going to be different you're not going to be like the rest of the world and so i think a lot of the dietary laws maybe fall under that and so and could it be hitting back to our other question about revival again that if we treated christianity with the same seriousness that early israel treated their law i mean if we uh walked an extra mile or turned the other cheek or visited the prison. I mean, if we really took like our law is Christ, and He gave a lot of stuff that we needed to do to be to to love our neighbor, right? Love God and love your neighbor. I mean, if we took it as serious as the dietary laws in Exodus and Leviticus and all the following, I mean, we would look different like Israel looked different. That's how come I think there was so much jealousy towards Israel is they were like, we're different. We know we're different. You can be mad all you want, but we're not going to change because this is who God created us to be. Now, they ended up always worshiping false idols and all that. That's a different story. But if we chose to look different the way that early Israel, maybe maybe, maybe books would be written about us one day. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's a book that actually. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible for you. Yeah. Uh, the, Their body weighs keeping it outside the camp. I mean, they were a much cleaner people than than other cultures right. of that time because of their religious and dietary laws. Yeah. And, it, and science backs it up. Back to the, yeah. the very beginning of the science backs it up. Okay. Well, it's been fun, but we've run late, and I think we're about done. <laughs>